Praise the Lord. Let's all stand together. For he saved my soul from sin.
in him because I can I can I can enjoy life knowing that God is in control. Amen. That doesn't mean that every day everything goes my way. 
But it means that I know that God's going to bring some good out of every situation. Amen? Good or bad or ugly. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles today, I want to talk to you about hearing His voice. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. And that's not distracting me at all. Amen. I'll just listen to that like an amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I think it got really noisy when all the mothers were bringing the little children to Jesus. And some of the disciples got upset. Maybe all of them did. But Jesus said, let them come. They're not bothering me. Praise the Lord. I like them to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said that you always err in their heart and they have not known my way. So I swear my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Today, if you will hear his voice. Let's pray. Father, thank you that today we have heard your voice. You have ministered to us as we have worshipped. You. you have reassured us that everything is all right. You're in control. And that we can trust in you and we can have peace and we can have joy, Lord. You have ministered to us. You've spoken to us, Lord, through the words of these beautiful worship songs, Lord, that we have sung. And now you've spoken to us through your written word in Hebrews chapter 3. And now we're asking you to speak to us through your preached word. And I'm asking you, Lord, to also speak to the hearts by your spirit individually. That you were, will tailor make this message for each one here. That they will hear what they need to hear, Lord. And we'll receive from you. And that you will be glorified. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being in the house of the Lord today. To be able to hear the word of the Lord and to worship with us. It's just so exciting, especially if you're visiting. You might think, well, I'm just nobody special. Well, you're special to us. Amen. And we're happy to have you. And we pray that God will encourage you. And for, for one thing for sure is you certainly will not leave here any worse for the wear. Amen. <laughs> but God will give you something that will, if you take a hold of it, amen, we'll give you a prescription today that if you take the prescription when you go home and you, and you believe and you receive and obey, that your life is going to be blessed. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something today. I believe in hearing the voice of God. And there are many ways that we hear the voice of God. We hear the voice of God as we read the Bible. That is for certain. That is for certain. But you know, the early church, by and large, for the, for the first several decades, didn't have uh, the written New Testament as we have today. All they had was the Old Testament. And even though they didn't have the, the New Testament, they heard the voice of God. They heard the voice of God through the preachers, through the apostles, Peter, James, and John, and all of them. There were a lot of preachers that God raised up in that early first century church. But then as the decades unfolded, God moved upon these holy men to record uh, in written form the word of God, uh, which we have. And we're blessed to have the New Testament. I'm glad that they committed it to writing. Amen. I'm also glad that there were people that their job was to copy the scriptures. They were called the scribes. And we get the word scribes, uh, scriptures is the same root, S-C-R-I-P. Script is the name of, you could say the writing. If somebody said fancy script, that's fancy writing. So scriptures means the written down word of God. The same word of God that was spoken, it became written. Amen. But God hasn't lost his voice today. He doesn't have laryngitis. God can still speak verbally to us. In fact, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, my sheep hear my voice. They don't just read their Bibles. That's important. But my sheep hear my voice. Everybody go, bam. 
<laughs> you are one of the sheep or rams or lambs of God. Amen. Jesus said to Peter, he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my rams. The sheep, the mature ones, the rams, the leaders. And the lambs are the, are the babies, the little ones. We've got some little ones here. And these lambs are going to be soon in Sunday school hearing the word of God on their level, really. We'll try to put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can reach them today. Amen. Now, uh, I do believe in the, in the voice of God. And I've heard God's voice numerous times. In fact, I believe I hear God's voice every day. But this scripture, and I may have read it hundreds of times, but today, the Lord woke me up, and the scripture came to me that I added to my notes here. I've read it hundreds of times, but I've never really noticed one little detail, and that is the word today. Today, God wants you to hear his voice. Today. Well, you say, well, that's quite a thing. I don't know if I've ever heard the voice of God. Well, let me tell you something. God is spirit. And when he speaks, he's not going to speak out into the atmosphere that you could hear the sound waves going through the air. You know, if there was no air, if we were in outer space and you tried to speak, it, you wouldn't hear anything because there'd be no air to communicate the sound waves. There'd be no sound waves. But here in this atmosphere surrounding the earth where we have oxygen, we speak, and it creates a ripple effect, and it moves. And the further you are from the source, the weaker the ripples are. Have you ever tossed a stone into a pond, and it was still as glass, smooth? And when you toss that stone into that pond, you saw some ripples, and it forms out concentric circles that move further and further and further. And what happens? The further you get from the source of that stone, the smaller the ripples. But they continue to move on, because that's how energy is. And so God speaks to us. And let me tell you something. Uh, the closer you are to God, the stronger his voice will appear. And the further we get from God, the weaker. It does not mean that God isn't speaking. It just means that we are far enough away that we cannot discern him speaking. One of the things that Jesus told us in the book of Revelation, in the first three chapters, he's writing to the churches, seven churches of Asia Minor, and he gives each one of them a distinct message. There's a lot of similarities in the messages, but there's a lot of differences as well. One of the statements that Jesus made repeatedly is these words, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So God is not speaking with the physical mouth, but God is speaking with his Spirit. And so if you're going to hear the voice of God and it's coming from his Spirit, you're going to receive it in your spirit. It is your spirit that will hear the voice of God. You say, well, that's, that's great, Brother Gal. I, I do believe that I've got a spirit. I'm alive. I'm moving. Your spirit is what gives life to your flesh. The Bible says that, that if the spirit is removed from the body, the body will die. It is your spirit that gives you life. And your spirit is the real you. It is the invisible part of you that nobody sees. But you're very, very much aware of your spirit, especially when we start talking about it. You know, if I say something very mean to you and I hurt your feelings, you're not going to have a bruise on your physical body, but you're going to feel a bruise on the inside. Where is that? That's in your spirit. It's also called uh, the subconscious. Scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists would refer to it as your subconscious. It's that part of you that you're not always aware of, but it is there, and it has a profound effect upon us. Amen? How many know that sometimes we react to situations and then we think, where did that come from? That came from your subconscious part. That came from your spirit. Amen. And that part is very, very real. Very, very vital part. In fact, it's even more important than the physical body that you and I feed and clothe 
and, uh, and we rest it. You know, we take pretty good care of our physical bodies. Um, but sometimes we don't take as good a care of our spirits because we're so busy with life that we don't nourish our spirits. And if your spirit is the part of you that is going to hear from God, if you neglect your spirit, if you don't allow uh, and cause your spirit to be healthy, then you're not going to be able to discern when God speaks to you. Another word for your spirit is also, and you will recognize this one, as soon as I tell you, you're going to recognize it, and you're going to think, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. You will become aware of it innately inside your physical body. Another name for the spirit is your conscience. Your conscience. How many of you are aware of your conscience? All right, if you are aware of your conscience, then you are aware of your spirit. It is that part of you that God will speak to. Now, the Bible says that the spirit of man is the can. That means people. The spirit of man. It means all mankind. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the person. The spirit of, the man, of man is the candle of the Lord. It is that part of you that God uses to enlighten you and show you things. Amen? And so now that we are a little bit more aware of the spirit, and we know that God is spirit, if God is going to speak to you, he's not going to speak to your mind or your intellect. He's not going to speak to your physical ears, but he's going to speak to your spirit or your conscience. That's where God is going to speak to you. And the Bible tells us very clearly today, if you will hear his voice. If you will hear his voice. The next verse is, harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts. Now the problem with Israel in the Old Testament, when they were wandering through the wilderness, is that they had a difficult time hearing from God. Because their hearts were hard. You say, well, what would cause a hardened heart? Let me tell you something. Life can cause a hardened heart. Disappointments can cause you. Have you ever found that at some times in your life you were more tender, you were more open, you were more vulnerable? And then if something happens, if somebody hurts you or offends you, how many know those walls can come up? I meet people for the first time, and it's so interesting. I love people. I really, really do. But I'm telling you, some people, their walls are so thick you can actually see them. There's walls all around them. You say, well, what do you mean? Um, I don't know. We just give off something. We give off a vibe, a feeling. Amen. And some people, they've been hurt so much, and they've built those walls of defenses up so that you know when you meet them for the first time, it could take a little while to really get to know the real person because they're protecting themselves from hurt. Not only are they protecting themselves from hurt, but like the song says, also from God. They're protecting themselves from God. How many know that God really loves you today? You know that's true. The Bible tells us that. We sang about it, Jesus loves me. You know, the thing about God is you can let the walls down. When you cannot trust another person, you can let the walls down and you can trust God. You say, well, I would really like to believe that. That would really change my life. You're right, it would. You've got to start with faith, right? In a relationship, you've got to start with faith. If you don't have faith, you don't have a relationship. Amen? And so with God, you've got to start with faith. The Bible says that um, God is a rewarder of faith. It says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must first, before anything else, must first believe that he is. And then secondly, we must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you want to know God today, you're going to know God. In fact, you may know God before the service is done today. How many believe that? Say amen. amen. You can know God today. But you must first of all approach him with faith. And then secondly, you must believe that if you seek him, that God will respond and will reward you. So it begins with faith. And without faith, even in the natural realm, you can't have a relationship with the, with the person. And it is faith in God is the first thing. The Bible says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, there's plenty of evidence around about us this morning. You walk by those flowers out there. Not one of us made those flowers. 
You say, well, somebody planted the seeds, but they didn't make the seeds. And they didn't make those seeds grow. They put them in the ground that God created. And the rain fell on them. And the sun shone on them. And they turned out into beautiful flowers. And they're still out there amidst the fact that we've had frost. Probably had some frost. But they're still surviving. Those flowers that you walk by are preaching a message this morning. They're telling you that God loves you. God created this beauty for you to enjoy. It's God's way of saying, hey, I love you. Why do you think he made the world so beautiful? Why do you think he made the sunsets? He's, he's communicated. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And the earth shows his handiwork. You know, just God sat down one day and just said, I'm going to do some handicrafts. And he made the world. It, it was no effort. He didn't break out into a sweat. There was no sweat on God's forehead when he made the earth. He spoke the word. The world into existence through his word. And he created all this beautiful world. And he created you. And you are special. Look at your neighbor and say, you are special. They don't grin when you say it to them. But they are. You are special. You are special to me. You are special to this church. You are special to the Lord. And if nobody ever thought that you were special, God does. Amen. The Bible says that we are wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Awesome is what it means. This is fearful. Awesome and wonderful. Look at your neighbor and say, you're awesome. You're awesome. You really are. That's what the Bible teaches us. And I believe that the further we get from the word of God in society, the further huh, down the path of destruction we go. This is what the Bible teaches us. And the Bible teaches us that we can have a living, daily relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Now, there are some teach, even in the church, even in some churches, um, they're cessationists. Cessationists believe that God spoke in the Old Testament and God spoke in the first century of the New Testament church. So up till about 100 AD and then God got laryngitis. They believe that God no longer spoke to us verbally, vocally, into our hearts. They're called cessationists. Cessationists are those who believe that. These things ceased. And I was reading a scripture this morning. It came to my, again, the Lord brought this scripture to my mind. And it said in Revelation chapter 11 that God is going to send two very powerful voices, witnesses, two, two men to um, Israel. In the very near future, you are going to see two men on the streets of Jerusalem and perhaps going through Israel as well. And they're going to be preachers of the gospel. They're going to preach for three and a half years. And God is going to supernaturally protect them. And the Bible says that they will prophesy. And I thought to myself, Lord, have my cessationist friends missed this scripture? Those that teach that prophecies only took place in the first century of the church. You know, um, from Jesus uh, going up to heaven and to the end of 100, 100 A.D., but the Bible says that in the last days, right at the time, around the time of the coming of the Lord, that these two men will prophesy. So if they are prophesying, then we know from this scripture alone and then hundreds of others that the gifts of the Spirit are still in evidence today. Amen? I'm very grateful for that. So God, God has given to us, and that's, I don't know, perhaps you, you noticed that years ago, but I just noticed that this morning. Amen. Now, Sometimes, when we go to hear the voice of God, we're not sure, is it me or is it God? How do I know? Do you have a voice? You hear the voices of other people replaying in your mind. And sometimes we wonder, well, how can I tell the difference between my voice and God's voice? Let me ask you a question. How many of you use the telephone? All right. Some of you, you text. We do more texting and emailing today. But for those of you, you old-fashioned folks that still use the telephone, and all, all of us once in a while are forced to pick up the telephone, you can, you can get away if you're texting. But with the phone, it's sometimes hard, hard to get off the other end, especially if you've got uh, a person that's very good at magnificent monologues. They can just carry the whole conversation. But when you pick up that phone, if you've got a phone call, um, Mary Louise, are you, your family in South Africa? Okay, is your mom there? 
All right. If you got a phone call from your mom in South Africa, I don't think you would be two seconds into that phone call. I'm talking about if you didn't have a call that's playing your phone. And when you heard her voice, you would automatically know the second that she began to speak. Oh, that's mom calling from South Africa. How could that be? How could you know? It's a, that's a long ways away, South Africa. Well, the fact is, she's had many a conversation with her mother. And so it is through conversations with God that we become familiar with his voice. Amen. Sometimes I like at Bible college, just as we're sitting there, it's really cool because at cafeteria at lunchtime, um, you, there's a lot of talk. It's, a, it's an exciting place at the Bible college. But after a while, after you've been there for you know a few weeks, you, you filter, you've just learned to filter it all out. And one time my wife was visiting at lunchtime when we were having lunch together, and she said, is it always this noisy? And I said, oh, I never noticed. <laughs> I really never noticed, because for me, I was so familiar with hearing all those voices. But sometimes, uh, there will be, uh, of course, every year there's new students that come in first years, and I'll hear the conversations, and sometimes I eavesdrop, well, you can't help it, you know, just enjoying your peas and carrots, and minding your peas and cues. <laughs> but you hear it, and you think, okay, oh, that's so-and-so talking, and and then once in a while you'll hear a voice and you think, okay, I recognize that voice, but I don't know who it is. And so I'll turn around to see who it is. But after, after a month or so, you get to know all those voices. And I've heard hundreds of young people talking in that cafeteria. But there's something about a voice. You can become familiar with that voice and you recognize it. One time we were visiting the parliament in Ottawa. And I was standing in line and there was a bunch of people ahead of us, a bunch of people behind us. And I heard a voice behind me, and I thought, I recognized that voice. That voice, it sounds so familiar. And it was a woman and a little child. The child was probably four or five years of age. And I turned around, and I looked, and it was nobody that I recognized. But the voice, I knew I had heard that voice. Come to find out, they were from Ontario. I had taught her sister voice lessons in Sussex, New Brunswick. And she had a little girl right around the same age. And both the mother's and the daughter's voices sounded like the, the aunt and the, and the cousin's voice. So anyway, we got chatting and I thought, well, maybe, maybe, you know, they're from back home. And anyway, she said, no, they were from Ontario. And she said, where are you from? And she said, um, and I said to her, well, we're from, um, we're from, um, I, I guess it's probably, I don't know where we were living at the time. It was probably Westfield, but she said, oh, she said, I have a sister. She said, who lives in Sussex. And I said, Mentioned the name, I think it was Diane. I said, Diane, yeah, she said, that's my sister. I said, well, you wouldn't believe this, but I said, when I heard you and your little girl talking behind me, I, I, your voice says, sounds so much like your sister and your niece. So anyway, that was just really cool how that was. So the more, the more we are around somebody, the more we will recognize their voice. The more we spend time in God's word, the more we recognize God's voice. You know, God will never tell you something like this. Oh, you're so stupid. You did it again. Oh, what a failure. You'll never. God doesn't talk that way. Amen? Right. And God's people don't talk that way to one another. Amen? Right. We, don't, we don't use that to try to motivate people. That does not motivate people. It discourages them. You know, sometimes kids have to be corrected. We need to correct them. We need to tell them what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. But we need to do it in a way that does not put them down. Amen? A way that gives them a vote of confidence. Now, that's not the way that you're to talk, or that's not the way you're to act. But um, God, he deals with us according to his word. And the word of God shows us the spirit and the attitude of God. So when you think you're hearing the voice of God, and it, you don't find that it is motivating you forward, you don't find that it is encouraging you to be a better person, it's probably not the voice of the Lord. Isn't that funny how the devil... He's so two-faced. You say, I don't believe in the devil. Well, I do. I believe in the devil. And the moment you start getting really close to God, you'll believe in the devil too. Amen. He'll come out of hiding. He'll tear off his disguise and he'll make himself known because he will try to stop you from advancing in the Lord. He'll try to discourage you. You know, the devil, he's so two-faced. He'll say, come on. You really deserve this. This will, this will be good for you. Nobody will know. It won't hurt you. You really, you know, you should do this. And the devil will tempt you. Amen? I'm talking, I'm talking to Christians. He will tempt a Christian to do something wrong. 
And the moment you have done something wrong, he'll come by and say, you're stupid. You know you shouldn't have done that. God's not going to love you. You're such a failure. He talks out of both sides of his mouth. Amen? Have you noticed that? But God doesn't do that. God is not two-faced. God will always be consistent. Everybody say consistent. consistent. And I say to you that the more consistent you and I in our, in our walk with God, in prayer and in the Word of God, and in endeavoring to live for God, not just hit or miss, you know, just when I feel like it, I'll, I'll obey God, but endeavoring to serve God. If we are consistent in our seeking of God, then God will show us his voice. I just read this verse. It was today or yesterday in my Bible devotions. I think it is, I think it is um, Jeremiah 33 and 3 that says, Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't even know about. I will reveal to you things. If you'll call upon me, I will answer you. All right, let's go back to the spirit for just a moment. So if God is spirit, he's not going to speak to your physical ears. He's going to speak to the ears of your spirit. Did you know your, your spirit has ears? I don't mean really like, you know, these things. Your spirit has the ability to hear from God. If we listen, if we silence the other voices around about us, the Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. You know, one of the most important things for us to do when we're praying after we poured out a heart to God in worship and poured out a repentance and our, our petitions before the Lord, the things that we need, and, and we've communicated with God, we've loved and we've praised God, we need to take some listening time. It's important in prayer to listen as much as it is to speak. You know, some people, you, you call them up on the phone and you think, oh Lord, how long is this going to be? And they're going to talk and talk and talk. And you're going to try to get a word in edgewise. If you're loud enough, if you're quick enough. God will toss the ball into your court. And then when you toss it back into God's court, he will have something to say. Now listen to this. God is speaking to you all the time. In fact, it's the nature of God to speak. He wants to have fellowship with you. And he wants you to hear him all the time. And God has promised to lead his children by his spirit. And to enable them to know his voice. That means you can learn to know exactly what the spirit of God is saying to you about every situation. You and I don't have to go through life blindly making decisions or relying on our own abilities. When we learn to tune into God's voice, it won't be an occasional event, but it will be an everyday part of life. Now, the first thing we need to do is check our receiver. How many of you remember back in the days when we had the rotary dials on the radio? Are you young enough or old enough <laughs> that you can remember? Tuning the radio. Some of them have like a wide tuner and then a fine tuner. And when you get close to that station, it may still be a little crackly, but you'll begin to hear it. You have to tune it until it becomes clear and the static disappears. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. Some of the static that we face in our lives is unforgiveness. If you're holding a grudge against somebody, the Bible tells us that if I don't forgive my brothers and my sisters, my my family, if I'm hurt, that God's forgiveness stops flowing. He said, we are to pray, forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not always an easy thing to forgive, but I tell you, it's harder not to forgive because we carry that acid in ourselves. You say, well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, you deserve to be free. Whether they deserve to be forgiven, that's not the, that's not the question. God forgave you, you didn't deserve it. So we forgive from our hearts because we don't want to carry this anger and this confusion around. Amen? As long as we hold that grudge, we're tying ourselves to that hurt and to the person that hurt us. Amen? 
But when we forgive, it's not like we're saying it doesn't matter. It's not that we're saying I wasn't hurt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that we're saying that they don't need to change. They need to change, but you can't change them. But what you can do is you can change yourself by forgiving. One of the greatest things I've learned to do is forgive. I'll tell you what, it feels wonderful to get rid of that static because the static of unforgiveness can hold us. And then you say, does that mean we just never, ever resolve? I'm not telling you that. We do need to seek to resolve things. We, we do need to work things out in relationships. We do in order to have that trust, in order to have that, that proper relationship that is, that is a win-win situation. Amen? But you must begin with forgiveness. It's got to start with that. Amen? That's static. Amen? Another bit of static that sometimes we experience is Selfishness. Oh, you say I'm not selfish. All right. What is it what Ann Landers used to say? Wake up and smell the coffee. You don't think you're selfish. Well, then you're really selfish. What? You see, a truly unselfish person is a person who has recognized their selfishness and dealt with it. Amen? We're all selfish. From the time we're born into this world, it's like, change my diaper, feed me, burp me, everything is, the world just revolves around me, right? And what do we learn as we get older that um, we need to learn to revolve around others? I remember one time I was trying to teach one of my sons, I think I know which one it was now, and I said, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. <laughs> Dad, just being very direct and very like point, but the world does not revolve around you. Well, he said, Dad, he said, am I your son? I said, yes. He said, well, doesn't the world revolve around the sun? <laughs> that's the kind of kids I have. Oh, that's cute. So I said, all right. You are not the sunshine. You are, the, you are my son. We have to learn. The Bible says that when we pray and ask God for something, if it's for a selfish motive and it's not for the good of everybody and for the glory of God, the Bible says that you'll ask and ask amiss. And sometimes we pray and say, oh God, please do this, please do that. And God says, nope. No, because you're only thinking about yourself. Is it wrong to think about yourself? No, you're going to think about yourself a little bit. But the thing is, if it's when we only think about ourselves. Amen. We need to open up our hearts and say, okay, God, this is a little bit bigger. What do you want to do, Lord, in this situation? How would you be glorified? How would this benefit me but others as well? Amen? If we pray kingdom prayers, we're not just living for ourselves. How many know that we're getting rid of a lot of static? Amen? Because a selfish heart's not going to be able to hear the voice of God. Now, let me ask you something. Do you expect to hear from God? Some people say, well, God just doesn't talk to me. But here is an important truth. Even when you don't feel like God speaks to you, he does. Somebody, God's speaking to somebody here today. He's telling you, you need to become a Christian. The voice of the Lord has spoke to you and said, you need to become a Christian. This is for you. He's speaking right now. But if you aren't expecting to hear from him, then you haven't even turned on the receiver. How many of you remember the old-fashioned radios? I have one sitting in my in the parsonage in our living room, and it looks like an old-fashioned radio, but you turn it on, it's transistor, it's instant on. And we're used to everything instant on, like God speak to me, and I'm giving you five seconds. I'm giving you five seconds, God, to speak to me and show me what to do. And but you remember the old-fashioned radios? This is, it's, this is an old-fashioned, this is probably uh, built in the 50s. They don't make them like this anymore. This has got the old tubes in it, the old tubes. Best tubes in the world made in Russia, they tell me. But there's old tubes, and if, you, if we were to take the back off this and bring you all up here, you'd get a real good shock. But um, actually, there's tubes, and they're glowing in here, and, and they, yeah, it's just like, kind of like a light bulb. And when you start this machine up, it's just quite, it's quite interesting because it's got a start button and you hold that on for 10 seconds and then you, it's a spring loader so you can hold it with your finger and then there's a run button. Actually, the start button, no, it just snaps into place. It's the run, no, 
I'm arguing with myself. Yes, the start button has a spring on it. You'll hold it for 10 seconds. And then while you're holding that, after 10 seconds, you'll, you turn on the run button, and then you hold them both for another 10 seconds, and you wait. And then after 10 seconds, you release the start button. It's kind of like a Model T. Right? <laughs> and then you let go of it. And then, and then it takes another 10 seconds because the tubes are just starting to warm up. But then after it warms up, you get some... Or at least I hope it sounds great. Some great music out of this organ. That's kind of like the old-fashioned radios. You turn them on, and it just took a while. It took probably 10, 20, 30 seconds for it to warm up. And that's the way it is with God. You know, God, you just don't snap your finger, and he's a celestial bellhop. Yes, at your service. <laughs> what can I do for you today? You know, it's like a genie in the bottle. Just rub it the right way. He's there to. That's not the way it is with God. You have to warm things up a bit. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, God's not looking for casual relationships today. God's looking for something that's warmed up. Are you warmed up today? Is your heart warming up to God? All right. Now listen, I will tell you this. Let's be clear. He isn't going to scream, yell, and demand that you pay attention. He's always speaking to you, but he speaks in a still, small voice. Now the story is in 1 Kings 19, and, and the Bible says that Elijah was discouraged. He needed a, a word from God. So he's standing there in this cave. He's running for his life. Queen Jezebel wants to kill him. He's a brave man. He just killed 400 prophets of Baal. But he ran from one woman. And he's hiding in this cave. And all of a sudden, a strong wind comes by. It's so strong, the Bible says, that the rocks begin to split. It was that powerful. But he said, God wasn't in the strong wind. Then there was an earthquake, and everything began to tremble and shake and rumble. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And there was a fire. Oh, surely God's going to be in the fire. After all, when Moses got the Ten Commandments, it was a fire on Mount Sinai. And many times God has manifested through fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And then the Bible says the fourth sensational thing that happened didn't really seem sensational, but it was because of the content. It was a still, small voice. And the Bible says, and God was in a still, small voice. That's why we have to still ourselves to hear the voice of God. We use the word an inner witness. God's voice is through an inner witness. The Bible says that when we are saved, the Spirit of God <coughs> bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. Amen? You know what that means? That means that when you're saved, you know it deep down within you. You know it in your knower. You just feel that that's a witness of the Spirit. Now, God, when he speaks, it's subtle. And it requires a closeness with God. Let me tell you something. How many of you, do you feel like you're pretty honest with yourself? Are you honest with yourself? That's a good thing. Because I have found this one thing. The people that are really honest with themselves can hear the voice of God more easily. The Bible says how we can come to a place where we know whether it's you or the Lord. It's by becoming united or joined with the Lord. The Bible says he that is united with the Lord, has become one spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit within you become united. Amen. It is through that union, through prayer, spending time in His Word, and learning to listen, that we become one with God. And so when God speaks to us, the voice comes to your spirit. You have to learn to listen. 
Now a receiver which is intact and ready to tune into the voice of God is like a person who is expecting to hear from him and is willing to learn his voice. Then we have to find his frequency. We've got to find the frequency of the Lord because as you know, on a radio, there's all kinds of different frequencies. Amen? And how do you locate the frequency God uses to speak to you? Well, most often, we miss his frequency because we're tuned in to hear some huge revelation. We want to hear something big, something awesome, something mind-blowing from the Lord uh, when God might be telling you just to clean out your closet or stop watching certain television shows or spend more time with your children. Hello? He will talk to you about the small things in your life that you need to change. Adjustments you need to make. He will begin to deal with you where you are which most often involves helping you to walk in God's best by getting rid of things that are holding you back. If you want to hear the voice of God, then you need to learn to hear the voice of God speaking to you about you and the little things in your life that God wants to address and change. Amen? God's not going to give you a big revelation about other things until, first of all, he can speak to you about you. And then, last of all, it must line up with the Word of God, the Bible. All Scripture is inspired by God. And one sure way to know if we're hearing God's voice is to line up what you hear against the Word of God. God will never tell you to do, think, or say anything that is contrary to His Word. If you have a thought and you don't know if it's God or not, you can look it up in the Bible and settle it right away. Amen? The Spirit of God will only tell you to do things that will give you a more abundant life. Every change he tells you to make is designed to bring blessing into your life and to minister grace to you. So he isn't going to tell you to refuse to forgive someone or to spend money frivolously or anything else that doesn't match his word. Amen? Amen? God always agrees with his written word, and his word always agrees with him. In fact, in Psalm 138 and 2, it says that God has magnified his word even above his name. That means that God has put his name on his written word in the way that we would put our name at the bottom of a contract. He has given his word as a covenant and signed it in the name of Jesus, amen, by the blood of Jesus. Since God cannot lie, there is no way he will ever do or say anything contrary to that word. He's absolutely joined himself to it forever. So God trains us to recognize his voice through his written word. He uses it to tune our spiritual ears to what is real so that we can easily recognize a counterfeit. One day I was working in the bank. And a $50 bill passed through the hands of the teller that was beside me. And I honestly don't know if I would have caught it. But they did a little training on us on counterfeit money beforehand. And I heard this statement. You learn to recognize the real, the counterfeit, not by handling the counterfeit, but by handling the real and becoming thoroughly familiar with the real. Amen. And this teller had worked there much longer than I had. And that's probably why she picked it up. She looked at it and she said, there's something on that. Isn't that amazing? how sharp her eye would be that she could pick that up. And honestly, when I looked at it, I thought, hey, if this had passed through my hand, I probably wouldn't have recognized it because of the lack of familiarity. Well, I just hadn't seen a whole lot of $50 in my life. <laughs> Maybe that was it. Too. Maybe if I had, had seen more $50, or if you allowed more $50 to pass through my hands, I would have recognized a counterfeit one. But amen. the best part about hearing God's voice is this. You won't just avoid counterfeit voices but you'll be given access to secrets and revelation knowledge that will make you the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy 28 and 13 tells us that that is God's desire to make us the head and not the tail. And as I've already quoted Jeremiah 33 and 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. 
So all you have to do is pursue a life in which you hear the voice of God, heed it, and walk into a victory you never thought possible. Say praise the Lord. When you check your receiver, find his frequency, learn to discern his voice, and line up what you hear with his word. Hearing God's voice won't be an occasional event, but a lifestyle. And when someone asks you, what is the Spirit of God telling you today? You won't hesitate for a moment. You'll know exactly what to say. Amen? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you today that we have been in your presence that you've touched our hearts and our lives. God, we're going to be changed as a result of your spirit. And because of the word, the message that we've heard today. Take us deeper, Lord. We pray that you'll answer the questions that we have. Give us a deeper understanding. And Lord, lead us all into a place where we are saved. Where we know that we're ready to meet you, Lord. Yes. Ready to meet the Lord and ready to go to heaven. Everybody that is here, Lord, I believe it's their desire to know that. And I pray that, God, you will continue to minister to us throughout this day. And in their evening service, bring out many visitors and touch them, Lord. Bless us, O oh God, through this day and make us a blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. We invite you to uh, slip out this way. Please come around this way. And uh, on your way out, if you would like to give something in the offering, feel free. But uh, if you're not able to, that's all right. This service is our gift to you. God bless you today.